Um, this is online, so you can either follow along online or whatever. Um, but you might want to take some, some notes here and there uh, as well. Um, so, what were we talking about last time? We talked about selection that we were talking about. Yes. We talking about. Downstream, upstream, background. Background, background. background selection, hitchhiking. All right. <clears throat> So that's kind of down at the molecular level. We talked about drift and we talked about selection and all that kind of stuff. Um, what I want to do is talk about a little bit about um, gene flow, how populations are sort of organized in space, and sort of bring all that sort of evolutionary sort of mechanistic stuff to some kind of practical sort of uh, head here. So that you can see that it's not all just a bunch of sort of dreamy molecular uh, whatever, but we can actually use this in some, some real application. So, um, first of all, is what we're going to talk about is population substructuring, because as we know, we've been talking about evolution as a population phenomenon, um, and we define a population briefly, shared gene pool, integrating individuals, all that stuff, but in reality, Sort of when you go out to measure a population, and let's say you want to measure like how many population the white-tailed deer in North Georgia, and you want to know like well how many populations am I really dealing with? Because that becomes an important management question. Is it one big population? Is it several little small populations? And in order to do that, we can use uh, genetics, and we can use genetics to begin to sort of sort out what we call population substructure. So basically this is quantified population substructure. There will be some equations and things like that. Uh, you don't have to memorize them. If you ever need them, they'll be given to you or you can look them up. But on the left hand side of that sort of big blue ball, you see what we call a panmictic population, right? Panmictic is a freely interbreeding uh, population set. Versus something where you have three independent populations. So in, in, in the left-hand side in the blue ball, you have a group of individuals that are sort of bounded in a single evolutionary trajectory, or as you might think of it, an evolutionary fate, right? That population is sort of acting as one evolutionary unit, right? And in some ways, if you take that down to a management level, you could call it a management unit. But in this case, you have three evolutionarily independent units. So although they may all be white-tailed deer, we'll say, they are sort of independent evolutionary or management units because they're not interacting. They are interbreeding within each sort of little bubble, but there's no interbreeding between. So there's random mating within, but not among populations. Got it? So how we quantify Sort of that, that idea of population subdivision, whether it's all a single population, what we call panmictic, or whether they are separate independent populations, we use the skies stuff. So right is no longer with us, with a sort of fixture in evolutionary biology in the in the, the, uh, the, the early 1900s and, and, and on. So we call it rights fixation index, sometimes called MST. Um, you also see it maybe as theta ST, RST, but always ST. And I'll explain what the ST means in a little bit. But FST is, is a common measure of sort of how subdivided a population is or isn't. And when we think about sort of how populations might be arranged in space, here are sort of five different examples of how populations may be arranged in space. And so you might want to write these down. The first one we call the cat call. No, kidding. <laughs> now the first one is called a continent island model. I don't have my pointer with me, so I'm going to have to just wave my arms. But that cat call look at the end of the, the big one is the continent, obviously, and the smaller one's islands. And do you notice which way the, the arrows are pointing? 
from the sort of larger population to the smaller population. So you have these sort of one large continent population and then sort of satellite or island populations. Migration is generally, or gene flow is generally in the direction of continent to island and with sort of a little bit sort of going back the other way. You know in chemistry equations where they draw, they're reversible, so, but it usually goes one way and then there's a little kind of arrow pointing back the other way. You can kind of do this. So there's, basically the continent influences the islands much more than the islands influence the continent. Okay. The next one over, letter B, is the island model. This is Sewell Wright, sort of uh, most of his, uh, his theoretical work came out of this kind of structure of uh, model. This is called the island model. Island. Got it? There are five little islands in there. Five little islands that are all interconnected. That individuals can move between any island, right? Do you see that? All the islands are connected. So individuals can move from any island to any other island. There's no restrictions on movement. Right? That's important because the island model, so an individual living here can move to any of the other four points from that point without having to go through any other island. Does that make sense? That's the island model, which is different than letter C, which is conveniently called the stepping stone model. Looks like stepping stones, right? This would be appropriate in a stream, let's say, where you had um, fish populations that live in the ripples of streams. And so every once in a while in a stream you have a ripple. Now, if you sort of label them A, B, C, and D, you can obviously see that population A cannot get to population C without going through B. Right? So that's the idea of the stepping stone model. This is a linear arrangement of populations. In the island model, from here you can go anywhere. In the stepping stone model, if you want to go somewhere, you have to go to the next one, and then the next one, and the next one. In other words, you can't skip, you can't skip over islands. You have to move that up. The uh, letter D is the two-dimensional stepping stone model. Just another possibility of how populations are arranged in space. It's not like the island model. It basically, any, any, um, from any one population, you can move to an adjacent population, but you cannot move to just any population. So individuals in this, or populations arranged in this kind of way can move to the next adjacent population in, in any direction but cannot just sort of leap over populations like in the island model in B, where you can go to anyone. What did you say it's called? Oh, the, the two-dimensional stepping stone model. So the same idea as letter C, except for somebody decided like, hey, what if we like put another row in there? <laughs> right, so they're both stepping stone models where you can only move to the adjacent square. So then these, these, these um, migration models have rules and, and they apply to and sometimes in population genetics, what we want to know, especially for management purposes, is how, what is the arrangement of populations so that we know how individuals are moving through the, the environment space. Letter E is sort of a funky one. If you had ecology, you might have heard the term metapopulation. <coughs> metapopulation technically means a population of populations, so metapopulation. Familiar with it? It's a metapopulation, a population of populations. What's the key to a metapopulation? Because all the others are sort of populations of populations, too. The key, the key, my friends, in a metapopulation is, well, you see the empty circle and then the sort of... Metapopulations go through periods of extinction and recolonization, right? So what you have is a, a source population and sink populations. The idea of metapopulations really has to involve this uh, source sink and um, colonization and extinction event. Okay? So it's different. It's sort of like an island model that has sort of, well, this population goes extinct occasionally and then is recolonized from these other Does that make sense? 
And there's one sort of fancy term we need to throw out there. So for all you biology geeks in the house, when, when we talk about subpopulations, the, the other term for that in population genetics is called a dean. So it's just a term that refers to, it just means subpopulation. So letter C has four deans in it. So that's a term you see occasionally. It's sort of an older term, but it does show up on exams and things like that. Not my exams, but other exams. Mm -hmm. We're talking about deans, and you just should know what that means. Thank you. Okay. Got that? Any questions on that? Oh, I moved it forward already. <laughs> so generally, what we're trying to do is sort of decide: Are we dealing with a single population, or where along this gradient are we? Or we have total isolation between the groups. So what you generally would do is go out and sample a variety of different locations, and what you want to know is, are they linked or not linked? Or what's going on? And so the right F statistic can help us sort out sort of where we are on this gradient. Now, what we're really talking about is gene flow between things, because gene flow is the key to linking populations, right? Populations that are not linked are going to evolve independently, whereas populations that are linked are going to evolve as a single unit. If you recall some of the simulations we did in genetic drift, when you add migration, those populations start to all sort of travel together. And even if an allele goes extinct in one population, another population will effectively rescue that allele uh, and put it back in that population. So we're talking about migration or gene flow. And there are sort of two general ways to measure that. One is uh, uh, direct methods. These are radio tagging or uh, mark recapture methods. Um, mark recapture would be uh, you, you would go out and sort of uh, sand up a bunch of fish, put little tags on them, and then maybe a couple of weeks later you go back and sand that same area and up and down the stream and see if you can recapture those individuals and see where they went from the last time you caught them. That's mark and recapture. That's fairly labor intensive. Uh, mark recaptures often have sort of a 20% recapture rate, which is fairly inefficient. So labor intensive and inefficient usually equals like a uh, real pain in the ass to get a good data set. Um, uh, radio tagging studies are, are, are fun but expensive. Um, in the Everglades, we have to fly uh, uh, fixed wing aircraft to go sort of search for gar that we radio tagged. And sometimes we find it in an alligator. And sometimes they actually move like 50 kilometers. You know, it's just a gar, it's about that big. You know, did a bird pick it up? What's it doing over there? You know? <laughs> but it's expensive. You got to fly around. You know, radio tagging whales, radio tagging all that. Great data, but perhaps unrealistic. In, in, not a realistic option for many things, right? If you don't have a private foundation to uh, fund your research. The other way is uh, indirect methods, um, and this can be done with just about anything, because as far as I know, everything has DNA unless you're an RNA virus, right? So indirect methods use uh, molecular marker DNA variation. And this is how we can estimate gene flow or at least the relationship between populations. So, let's consider an example so we can sort of start putting um, real numbers to uh, population differentiation. Here we have um, two populations that have completely diverged from each other, and obviously, so we have A1 and A2 as the two alleles. In population one, we're pretty much fixed for the A1 allele, and in population two, we are fixed for the A2 allele, yes? <clears throat> if we sort of combined those populations and went out and, and decided, well, uh, we don't know that they're two separate populations or whatever, we just wanted to sort of combine them, our overall Hardy-Weinberg Hardy -Weinberg expectations would be uh, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0 0.25 because if we take the, uh, if we sort of combine all these, we would get an allele frequency for A1 of 0.5 and, and of A2 for 0.5. Yes? If you consider those two populations together. Right? So this would be our expectation, but obviously they're not going to follow expectations. Now, 
if we wanted to know sort of how different are population one and population two, and of course we want to put a number to that because we're scientists after all, and we like to do that, we would use FST. FST ranges from zero to one. Conveniently, when it's zero, it means there is no difference in allele frequencies between populations. FST is sort of generally uh, gives you a, a number that gives you an estimation of how different allele frequencies are between populations. In the population example I just gave you, the allele frequencies could not be any different. So FST is going to compare the average expected heterozygosity of individual subpopulations to that if, as if you considered it one total population. And I will give you an example of that. But it's really going to be a ratio of Hardy-Weinberg expectations sort of on average within any one subset of populations compared to that what you expect from the whole population if it was a randomly mating population. Again, this is the equation. FST is going to take what is the expected total heterozygosity minus the average uh, heterozygosity within subpopulations divided by the total for uh, one minus that ratio. Again, if all the populations that you're looking at are freely interbreeding, then FST will be zero because there will be no differences in allele frequencies between those populations because they're freely interbreeding. Make sense? However, if they are completely isolated from each other and allele frequencies are completely divergent as they were in the previous example, then you will have an FST of one. That requires that the allele frequencies be completely divergent. As a matter of fact, in reality, you will never really see an FST value of 1. That's extremely high. And you would start to think, hmm, I wonder if these are different species because they're so entirely different. Right? So that's really high. But it's just to sort of uh, dichotomize the thing. So Here's how this works, and here's how you sort of do the math. So, and I would encourage you to sort of walk through this again at some point before the next exam. Here we have three deems, three subpopulations that we've gone out and sampled, and we measured allele frequency for A1 and A2, so we'll call it T and Q. So here's the allele frequency for A1, or P, 0.7 and 0.3 in subpopulation 1, 0.5 and 0.5, 0.3 and 0.7. Obviously, all three of these subpopulations have different allele frequencies, right? The FST allows us to sort of quantify that difference and let us know. And also, as you'll see, allows us to also sort of quantify migration between them. So what we need is HS, the heterozygosity expected in the subpopulation. That's 2PQ for each subpopulation. This is 2PQ for this subpopulation, 2PQ for that subpopulation, and so on, right? We take the average. That becomes our HS for that equation we were looking at. The average heterozygosity expected within any one subpopulation using the allele frequencies we measured from those subpopulations. Yes? It's actually easy to keep all your ducks in a row. You just sort of line them up. You understand what those... Uh, HSs are over here? No. 2PQ for subpopulation 1, 2PQ, 2PQ, and then the, this is the average of those. And that's because we're looking for the expected heterozygosity? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, within each subpopulation, the heterozygosity that we expect, and then that average over the total. Okay. So that gives us HS. HT is somewhat slightly different. You're going to take the average allele frequencies for each across the subpopulation. So you take the average P and the average Q and then calculate 2PQ. If the populations are randomly mating and allele frequencies are relatively equal, then the ratio of HS to HT will be approximately 1 because those numbers should be about equal. However, if allele frequencies are quite divergent, then HS and HT will be somewhat different. And HS will usually be lower than HT. So HT is what again? HT is generated by averaging P across the subpopulations, which is 0.5, and averaging Q across the subpopulations, which is 0.5, and then calculating 2PQ. Okay. That becomes HT. You understand the difference? For HS, you calculate 2PQ for each population. 
for HT, you calculate the average allele frequencies and then calculate 2PQ, expected heterozygosity. You're looking at the ratios of expected heterozygosity, basically the average expected within populations compared to the average expected over all populations. If that ratio is 1, FST becomes 0. <coughs> In our example, here's the, this, this sort of how the numbers play out, and we get an FST of 0.11. Yay. What does that mean? Does it mean there's population subdivision? If I saw a number like that in my research, I would be very happy. I would be <gasps> buying drinks. Ooh, 0.11. That's actually a pretty good FST. So that means that they are probably significantly different. There's a way to do this statistically where you end up with p-value and all that, but we won't worry about that. So, so that's the numbers sort of played out. Everybody understand where this number came from? So that's telling you that each subpopulation is significantly different from each other? Right, so, well, it doesn't tell you which ones because they didn't have to sort of go look, uh, but it tells you there's definitely a difference between subpopulations. Okay. Now the key is like, you know, when you do this over 20 different locations, 50 different locations, what I've done, and you get this number, you got to go and then sort out like, where are the big differences? Okay. And you begin to sort of tease so that out. So what would be a bad number for FST? Um, real low, like 0 0.01 or 0 0.001. And when you do the statistics, it's going to sort of give you, and it's going to give you a p-value of whether or not this is significantly different than 0 or not. Okay. Got it? You think you could sort of... So look that over, there'll, there'll definitely be something like that to do. Um, so, FST sort of more than just more than just sort of telling us, aha, we have population subdivision, but that also tells us it means we have restricted gene flow between some aspects of our population. So there's, there's a few right up there. And what he was trying to do is sort of want to take this. How much? If we know population subdivision, can we sort of then estimate how much gene flow there is between populations? Because what, what the FST is telling us is that there's restricted gene flow. In other words, it's not completely randomly mating between all those subpopulations, right? There's some restriction of gene flow. But can we sort of use an FST to estimate that? And well, we can. So FST gives us a level of subdivision, and then we can use that basically to estimate gene flow between our subpopulations, which is what we really want. Again, equations that you need not memorize. <coughs> but the relationship between NM, the number of migrants, so big N, little m, is referring to the number of migrants per generation. So this is the absolute number of individuals that, that enter a population or, or migrate. This is the equation, FST equals 1 divided by 1 plus uh, 4 nm. And um, when the number of migrants equals 0, FST is going to go to 1 in this case. Sort of little rules of thumb. When we look at sort of levels of migration and how that affects FST, we end up here. Sort of through that equation, and you kind of run those numbers through. You know, with, if there is one migrant every fourth generation, that is, every four generations, one individual actually migrates between the populations, we can get an FST of 0.5. One migrant every generation, FST drops to 0.2, and two migrants is basically where our FST was, right? So we know FST, we can estimate number of migrants from that equation. So basically, we would have approximately two migrants per generation from our previous work that are moving between populations. You see that? Yes? No? Yeah. <clears throat> the relationship between FST and number of migrants, number of migrants per generation is on the, um, on the x-axis and FST on the y-axis. Um, you see it drops off pretty quick and basically there's a sort of rule of thumb that once you get past four migrants per generation, 
then FST is effectively becomes zero. So below one migrant per generation, FST climbs pretty steep, doesn't it? It goes up pretty quickly, yes? Above four, it drops off to almost zero. So that sort of sticky spot is really between one and four, um, where you get some population subdivision, but the populations are linked, but they're not that tightly linked. Does that make sense? That's the sort of gray area there, between one and four. Um, if the FST is a, is a value of how different the allele free sequences are, and <clears throat> and my, you know, uh, my, my microorganisms can bring new, uh, new alleles, so why does the FST go down? Because it's, they don't necessarily bring new alleles, they bring it's the same, usually the same alleles. So there, there's, um, generally there's not, they don't bring novel alleles, because these are still the same species. Right? So um, they're dealing with the same kinds of alleles, but they're in different frequencies and different gene pools. And but as migration sort of links those gene pools, then the frequencies will become sort of harmonized as well or, or homogenized. Right? So the tighter the populations are linked, the more similar the allele frequencies will be. In other words, if they're breeding together, they're going to share the same gene pool, which means their allele frequencies are going to be identical. If they're not, then we can begin to quantify exactly how much they are not alike. And at some level, and from a management perspective, you would say, okay, at this level of subpopulation subdivision, we need to begin to consider them separate subpopulations where you're treating them or managing them differently. Or you might say, there's too much population subdivision, we need to increase the number of migrant organisms per generation by creating corridors, knocking down barriers, whatever that is. So, toads and roads. Here's a bunch of toads. And these toads are living in a panmictic population, randomly mating. Everybody's happy. We'll begin with allele frequencies of 0.5 initially for big A and little a, but we'll call those P and Q. Um, so what should happen to big A and little a, assuming they're neutral and the, the toad population is sort of finite? They should drift, right? And depending on the size of that population, they may drift sort of wildly if it's small or whatever. But what if we had a road? Now let's say it's a pretty substantial road where the toads don't cross the roads without getting squished on a regular basis. In other words, it becomes a relatively effective barrier to movement. So now this, what was whole population has now been subdivided. Population fragmentation is the uh, sort of leading cause of species extirpation in our world today, that is, local extinctions. Because usually we've taken large populations and we've divided the land up with suburbs and things like that, and now things can't move the way they used to. So let's say they all get sort of subdivided. What will happen to the frequencies of big A and little a in each subpopulation? Will they do the same thing? Will they do different things? More within each population. They'll drift even more within each population, and will they drift the same way? No. No, because drift is random, right? That's the whole idea. Right? So this population in the top left corner will drift and have an entirely different outcome than this population in the bottom right hand corner, because they are now sort of evolving independently. And drift is having a larger effect because you're dealing with smaller population size. They will each deviate from Hardy Weinberg in their own unique way. So, F statistics have this sort of hierarchy thing. We talked about FST, and then I want to introduce two more F statistics. Um, and then they are sort of hierarchical in nature. The little sub, sub letters, I, S, and T, all stand for different things. I stands for the individual level. S for the subpopulation level and T for the total level. And when you put S and T together, what you're referring to is sort of the difference between the subpopulation, number HS, and the total HT. You're looking at that kind of ratio. When you're looking at FIS, you're looking at sort of the average individual heterozygosity compared to what's expected in the subpopulation. FIS 
is, is a relatively important measure. Um, a technical definition is the proportional loss of heterozygosity due to recent common ancestry. In sort of simpler language, that means inbreeding. Inbreeding, what's the effect of inbreeding? You decrease heterozygosity and increase homozygosity, right? Because you're breeding individuals of similar genotypes, so you, you increase homozygosity. That's what that means, proportional loss of heterozygosity due to sort of inbreeding, common ancestry. So FIS is actually a measure of inbreeding in a population. So as you're doing sort of your um, hardy Weinberg statistics, FIS is sort of is looking at the expected heterozygosity of a population and the observed heterozygosity population. And when the observed is lower than expected, then FIS becomes important because if you're getting less heterozygosity than you expect, it suggests that you're, you're having inbreeding within that population, right? Because it's going to increase homozygosity and decrease heterozygosity. So FIS also ranges from zero to one, and when it is significant, it is indicating inbreeding in your population, and that could be an important thing to sort of keep in mind. FST um, is basically the um, a measure of population divergence, as it says, proportional loss of heterozygosity due to population subdivision, and then random drift within each dean. Right? Again, when we're talking about population subdivision and divergence, we're not sort of throwing out selection at all. We're just usually assuming a drift model. And the reason is selection happens, but selection, as, as um, Chimera suggested, is sort of infrequent enough that in your day-to-day -day calculations, you might as well not worry about it. Because populations will diverge and, and by drift, and it's, it's, a, it's a reasonable model. So, the other way to think about it is the total genetic variation that can be found among populations rather than within them. In other words, you guys, did you guys do uh, analysis of variation in statistics, biostatistics, ANOVAs? Did you ever get to those? <coughs> in statistics, when you do statistics, you're generally proportioning variation, right? to within and between. When you're doing, this is the same deal, you're looking at the variation within populations and within each population, and then you have the total variation, and what you effectively are doing is subtracting all the variation you can explain within populations, and whatever's left is the variation between populations. And that's what FST represents, is the variation between populations. That is genetic divergence. And one last one, so we've done FIS, which is the individual to the subpopulation, FST, which is the subpopulation to the total variation, and then, of course, there's individual to the total, the only term that's left. I will tell you, as a sort of rule of thumb, when, like when I write papers, when I read papers, I never see FIT. It's never really reported, because FIS is inbreeding, FST is population divergence, and FIT is sort of what's left over. And it doesn't really mean much, because it's looking at sort of the variation in the individual, the total, it doesn't have any sort of, it's a leftover term in the math, <laughs> right? You gotta have it. Basically, FIS plus FST equals FIT, okay? These two together should equal that. And what that sort of little definition says is basically the, the proportion of heterozygosity lost because of inbreeding and population subdivision. FIT is really just a combination of the other two. And again, you never see it reported in, in, in papers because it doesn't really mean much in the interpretation of the information. Just a mathematical leftover term that gets no respect. Okay? Get it? In short, FST and number of migrants are related.
when migration is, is very, very strong, there's going to be very little divergence. Sometimes you see uh, NM, because you'll also see NM written as NEM, because what that means is number of effective migrants. And sometimes if you have the data or the power of the data to do that, you would sort of estimate effective migrants, that is, uh, over just number of migrants, or we call it NEM. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible jokes. <clears throat> when there's a lot of migration, there's going to be very little divergence because of drift, right? So populations will be linked. When there's very little migration, drift becomes very important within each subpopulation and they will diverge from each other. In other words, they begin to act as evolutionarily independent units. Okay? So, what does all this mean in the sort of, like, what we can do in the, in the real world? Because, in some ways, I understand that can be a little bit boring. <laughs> but here's the Florida Panther. And understanding the Florida Panther requires a sort of, the story of Florida Panther requires that you sort of have some background in Hardy Weinberg and understanding sort of genetics and FSTs and all that kind of stuff. There are many sort of stories like this, but this one's the sort of shortest and funnest I think it's going to come up. There are some longer ones. But, you know, maybe you know, maybe you don't, the Florida panther, the cougar, the nittany lion, whatever lion uh, that you think of, the mountain lion, the puma, what other names do they go by in North America and Central America? They're all one species. Right? So the 29, there are 29 subspecies of panther, which is not a species designation. But they're all, um, so the puma, all that cougar. I often wondered, you know, when I was little, and then I found out, and then it became kind of boring, like, they're all the same? Yeah. Anyway, they usually widespread. Widespread throughout North America, very uh, recluse animal. Sometimes hard to sort of really get a good number on how many are actually there. But um, the South Florida has the, the Florida panther, and there's only about 60 or 70 of them left. But the, the, the panther, the cougar, whatever, is a good example of habitat fragmentation because who wants a cougar living in their neighborhood, right? There's definitely a conflict between, I mean, they may be cool and all, but you really, right, you know, animal control is going to have to come out. <laughs> I had a black bear in my, my neighborhood. I only lived down the street All right. a couple of years ago. 45 dot uh, Just a young male who was migrating in the spring. So we had a farm in Rome with an elephant here. We have a picture of them. Um, oh, yeah. They, they have been showing up in, in yeah. more and more. I think a couple of years ago, there was one uh, on a kid's playground set in the, back of, in the backyard of one of those hot dog locations at home. So. Cool. See, I like that kind of stuff, but a lot of people don't. <laughs> um, they have, a lot of animals like the cougar and, and, and the, the fish and wildlife and those people have been keeping it kind of hush-hush actually they, they often don't sort of openly admit that um, there's been some evidence of cougars so did they just migrate to the Midwest or was it because of human no they, they were there um, like they, just consider they were widespread and then we came and they're no longer widespread they are in little patches Right, so most of the cougar populations are not connected anymore. They used to be linked. Right, they used to actually sort of function more like an island model. Remember the island model? Individuals can move around. Um, now that's not true. All of the sort of corridors, because who's going to make a corridor for cougars to walk down, right? Like on 75, there's the cougar lane. <laughs> anyway, South Florida is a. <laughs> Uh, where where the, the Florida panther lives, um, 900 people a day move to Florida, most of them to South Florida. So the South Florida population is expanding. And again, the, the humans and cougars don't do well. So they're federally listed as endangered um, in 1967. Small population. Did I mention the number 1,024 in this class? <coughs> 
So how many people are related directly to you if you draw your family tree back ten generations? <laughs> right? Two to the ten. Is that number? In other words, if you like start with you, and then you draw your parents, and then their parents, and then their parents, 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 right? You would end up with 1,024 people that are directly related to you from 200 years ago. Say, say 10 generations with a generation time of 20 years, which but is generous. genetically, the person at the top didn't. So really... that's a fairly profound number, I think, right? Because you think about it, like thousand people, like are directly related. You have their stuff. You carry their stuff with you. <laughs> If you think about that number another way, any population that is less than 1,000 individuals will inevitably be inbred within 10 generations because at some point you have no choice. Right? As a population that that small, eventually you get to first cousins and, and half step matings and things because what other choice do you have? After 10 generations, everybody is related. Populations that live in very small population sizes run into this problem. How many panthers did I say there were? That's way less than, I said 60 to 70. That's way less than that. <clears throat> Thus, therefore, the Florida panther was running into some serious issues. Inbreeding depression. Inbreeding doesn't cause depression, directly. But inbreeding may expose recess, deleterious recessive alleles. Yes? No, what happened? Wild family with yeah. <laughs> so inbreeding, um, inbreeding doesn't have to be bad, but it usually is. Yeah. So here's the uh, the long and short. I'd like to explain to you something called mutational meltdown, which I think is a good name for a band. <laughs> You can have it if you want. Nobody's ever. I'm, I'm not going to use it. I have. You sure? Yeah. That, I, I, have, I have my band name. <laughs> Somebody else can use it. Lynch and Gabriel, Michael Lynch and uh, Gabriel, uh, are responsible for this mutational meltdown. I did. So in mutation and meltdown, you have what we call an accumulation of deleterious recessive alleles. Mostly deleterious alleles are going to, natural selection is going to get rid of them, right? But there are scenarios where deleterious recessive alleles can become fixed in populations, especially when those populations are small. The amount of deleterious recessive alleles that are sort of residing in a genome at any one time is called its genetic load. In other words, it's the stuff that's sort of dragging it down. Right? So this is the sort of weight, if you will, put on the, on the genome. Because these are not so good deleterious recessive alleles that would decrease the average fitness of the individual should they be carrying around. So every population has a genetic load, has a sort of deleterious recessive allele baggage they're carrying around. Does that make sense? Inbreeding is going to decrease heterozygosity, increase homozygosity, and effectively expose those deleterious recessive alleles in the homozygous state. Yes? We're not worried about dominant alleles because those would be sort of selected against real quick and they wouldn't. So it's the recessive ones, the ones that kind of hide a little bit in the, in the heterozygote that are going to really contribute to, their, to the genetic load. So, um, when a population begins inbreeding, 
as they will do if they get to small population sizes, then you're going to begin to expose a lot of deleterious recessive alleles. What do you figure happens to the average fitness of that population? Exposure to the deleterious recessive alleles is going to decrease the average fitness of the population. Which is effectively decreasing the fecundity of the population. That's reproductive success, right? The average fitness is really survivorship and reproductive success. I just call it fecundity. Your reproductive success goes down. What happens if your reproductive success goes down to your population size? It's going to go down. As a result of that, you get a decrease in the population size. Which increases the effects of genetic drift. Which is going to fix more deleterious recessive alleles. Because drift is going to have a larger play a larger role, right? As a result of increased genetic drift. More deleterious success of alleles. You get to sort of show up in the population. Your population size is shrinking, genetic drift is playing a stronger role, your average fitness is going down. This is terrible. This is called mutation meltdown. What do you think the eventual end of the mutation of meltdown is? Extinction. Extinction. Right? This is a spiraling down to extinction. It is a positive feedback loop in extinction that results in extinction. That's mutational meltdown. In, con in conservation work, it goes by another name called the extinction vortex. Another good band name. Hmm? Another good band name. Yeah, I always thought mutational meltdown, the first album could be extinction vortex. <laughs> <laughs> if you still, still do albums, maybe your, your collection of MP3s, I don't know what you do anymore. <laughs> Does that make sense? The extinction vortex, and then really there's sort of this idea that once a population gets into that sort of vortex, it's, it's not getting out. It may take a while, but eventually it will go extinct because it's a positive feedback loop that sort of, there's no escape from it. Sort of like crossing the event horizon of a black hole, right? Once the population is sort of gotten into that vortex, the only way we can get them out is genetic rescue. And here we have the Florida panther. The males have kink tails, they have cardiac defects, they have poor semen quality, they have one undescended testicle, and high disease prevalence. These guys are in bad shape, right? Yeah. The, the females are walking around going, really? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guy. We, these guys are in bad shape. They need a rescue. Right. And they need a management intervention <laughs> because there are no cougars sort of wandering down into South Florida because there's no way for them to get there. There's no corridor. There's no gene flow. Right? This population is living in isolation. And it's a small population. And inbreeding became a problem. In other words, they are basically caught in this uh, mutational meltdown or extinction vortex. So in 1995, under some controversy, because some people didn't want to sort of ruin the integrity of the Florida panther, Eight females from Texas were introduced. No males, because then why would they choose the Florida panther, right? Eight females were introduced, which is the nearest source of, of, of cats, so um, did it work? It did. It's what we call a genetic rescue. In other words, they were sort of brought back from that brink of the extinction vortex by introducing um, new alleles and bringing that population out of inbreeding depression, basically. Reconstituted their genetics, essentially, providing genetic diversity, which was declining rapidly because of inbreeding and then uh, uh, genetic drift and small population size. So 
without sort of going into the, the whole deal, it worked. Okay? The, the kittens from the, those cross, outcrossed individuals did very well and have been doing well. It's a viable management tool. We do this for tigers sometimes, although we've heard we've stopped doing that. Uh, red cockaded woodpeckers in the southeast, some of them live in sort of larger populations, some of them very small. It's an endangered species in the southeast that lives in old growth uh, pine forests. Um, but some in the small populations, because they live in such small populations and there's no migration between them, we actually like put them in a car and drive them over and, and migrate them. So, that is called genetic rescue, and that was successful for the panther. It's been successful for the greater prairie chicken and, and a number of other species as well. Um, the important thing is to recognize that um, in order to sort of make these kinds of man management decisions, we need to recognize inbreeding depression, and we need to recognize when populations are no longer experiencing gene flow. So we can, we can measure that. We can measure population substructure and use that to build a management plan that is reasonable or, or reintroduce cores or things like that. All right. So um, last but not least, I want to sort of bring up something uh, that I know one of you is familiar with, but the rest of you may not be. Something called the extinction. So the, the Florida panther is an example where we have something to rescue it. We have another set of cougars that we can bring in. And, but what do we do with the species that, that's not possible? Because there are lots of species that live in that same kind of situation, but there is no rescue. There's no cavalry. There's no other species to go to, to, to reintroduce or to sort of revitalize their, their genome. And then there's this, the extinction. Bringing species back to life that have gone extinct. Jurassic Park, Frankenstein. These are all sort of mythological creations, but Jurassic Park is now possible, I think. And in some cases, we were the cause of extinction. Should we fix it? In other cases, like, we might not have been the cause, and, and maybe we shouldn't tinker with it. I don't know. I'm not here to tell you what's right and what's wrong, but I will sort of tell you a few stories about it, and you can decide. But this is the passenger pigeon, and we call it the first high-tech extinction. That's Martha, by the way. <clears throat> passenger pigeons may have been very numerous, bird, most, may have been the most numerous bird on the planet, about five billion. Um, made up quite a considerable stock of the North American bird population. As a matter of fact, flocks one mile wide, 300 miles oh. long. We all travel in mass, perhaps protection, protection against predators, uh, for warmth, whatever, that's just what they did. And people would talk about them sort of flying overhead for hours. And I bet you'd have to have an umbrella to watch that show. <laughs> <laughs> and imagine all the nitrogen that would be introduced into the soil, right? So, lots of other things ate, but we, we exploited passenger pigeon flocks, nettings, mass shootings, and as they were collected, they were shipped off to New York, and they were made for food and for, for feathers. And the railroad became an important sort of sh shipment mechanism, right? So now you can get them to market fast. You net them, you bag them, you put them on the, the railroad, and off they go to New York, and they can be eaten by the fancy. So in 1860, they start noting declines after sort of uh, lots of. <coughs> but the species probably could have even survived all of that. <clears throat> but then pigeons were also hunted nesting sites. And hunters used telegraphs to communicate with each other where the nesting sites were, where the birds were. In other words, we began to use technology, just like the whale populations. If we were just sort of going out there in a boat like Moby Dick and fighting them with a spear, which is nuts, by the way. Uh, then, you know, they, they had at least a fighting chance, but have you seen some of the high-tech stuff they did with whaling? Right? These, these rifles that would fire balloons into the whale, so that cause some of the whales didn't float. They didn't have enough fat. But they were harvested anyway, because they would basically inject these balloons into them so they would float. And the technologies that came along with whaling is what the problem was. Not necessarily that we were hunting whales, but that we were hunting whales high-tech, high and, and just they lost any kind of chance. 
pit master pigeon is the one that we can sort of pinpoint to the hour when we killed the last one or the last one died. So the conservation efforts were too little too late. The last wild pigeons were shot in Wisconsin and Ohio in 1899. Um, capped the breeding efforts because not everything likes to live in a zoo and breed in a zoo. Some things just don't do it. And the parrot passenger pigeon is what? Last bird, Cincinnati Zoo, that's Martha, died in 1914 at 1 p.m. on September 14th. So, we can time that extinction to the hour. But we have our DNA. Some say that we are, we'll talk about this another time, but we may be the sort of sixth extinction, the human meteorite. And mass extinctions are sort of common. Again, we'll talk about this, the greatest being at the Permian. But, you know, we've done some, some horrible things. The, the stellar sea cow, we hunted to extinction. The great auk, the penguin of the North of Atlantic we hunted to extinction. The Carolina parakeet, a beautiful bird that used to live in North America, was considered a pest because it was just too adaptive for its own good, right? It would eat the grain and, and stuff that got in farmer's way, and we want to eradicate something, we're darn good at it. Cute little bird, no longer with us, disappeared sometime in the early 1900s, but the bald eagle, a conservation success. If you go to um, Chesapeake Bay, they're apparently they're sort of Overcrowded with bald eagles. We've done such a good job. Manatee, southern white rhino, um, the gorilla, elephant, seal. I mean, these were all brought back from the brink of extinction, and so they're not in sort of immediate danger of extinction. But um, we can we can have some success when we want to. <clears throat> but de extinction is a totally different sort of deal. This is sort of bringing life back from DNA that's dead. We're talking about taking Martha's DNA and bringing the passenger pigeon back to the planet. It works like this. You know Dolly. Say hello, Dolly. You remember Dolly? Yeah. <clears throat> you learned about Dolly at some point in your life? Yeah. You know that what's really cool about Dolly is not that Dolly is Dolly, because but that the, the, the genome got reprogrammed, right? It went back to being a cell that could, that could um, differentiate. It became undifferentiated from a differentiated cell. That's what's important. And that was in the 90s. That was like forever ago. It's like an eternity ago. They named this sheep Dolly. They took a donor egg from a black faced sheep and um, the cell from the, the white faced sheep and fused them. You know, this is like the Frankenstein thing. <laughs> and they were able to sort of um, make this clone. Without sort of going into, uh, she's the first clone mammal. We have cloned frogs. And, you know, that's the significance. But now, cloning, especially mammals, birds have presented a particular problem with cloning. But mammals have been actually cloned a lot. And we do it every day. It's... You know, they went from, woo some success to, now it's relatively routine to be able to do that. If you want to get into cloning, you can go to UGA and they have a whole cloning institute. There's a whole building dedicated to it. It's common technology. But, modern cloning takes DNA from a living cell and puts it into a living cell. The extinction is proposing that we take DNA that was dead from a dead cell and basically revive it. Dr. Frankenstein, In 10 years ago, over 10 years ago, this was actually done. This was a National Geographic last summer, 10 years after the fact. This little um, Ibex had gone extinct relatively recently, and they basically tried to bring it back by using surrogates and um, they, it was born and died soon after. So um, it had all kinds of problems. It wasn't, uh, wasn't quite well formed. It had some lung problems, that kind of stuff. But the fact remains is, just like Dolly, which was a screaming success because there were you know, thousands of efforts and one finally makes. But here's how it works. Here's my guide to how to real quickly. You're going you're gonna to need a genome. 
Today, getting genomes is not a big deal, and computers reassemble genomes for us all the time. The trick is when you get the genome out of something like Neanderthal, reassembling it, but we have uh, modern humans to sort of use as a guide. With uh, Martha the pigeon, the, we would use uh, the, the fantail pigeon, I think it is, the closest living relative. So you build a nice phylogeny, and then you take the closest one, and you can look at the DNA and use that. So in Jurassic Park, they used amphibian DNA. Why would they do that? That's dumb. Anyway, <laughs> could he use a bird or something, right? Something closely related, but regardless of that. But here, uh, here the idea is like you, you have your DNA, you're basically going to reconstruct the genome in its structure uh, and then um, reassemble it. And then, as you know, like when I want primers, I just sort of send off my primer sequence to a, syn a synthesis lab, and they, so they can, you can build DNA all day. If you know the sequence, you can send it off, type it in, and the machine will make it for you. So we can build genome, basically. We haven't had lots of success doing it, but we're getting there. Maybe you kind of run into the problem that we were discussing earlier as far as having like a sustainable population, because if you only clone a yeah. individual, I mean, you can't. Well, that, yeah, when you talk about the ecology, the whole idea just becomes, well, it'll be good for the zoo, but what else can you do? Yeah. yeah. Um, so you're going to synthesize that uh, the DNA. Um, the bantail pigeon is going to be the closest living relative, so for the passenger pigeon. Um, you basically construct your, just like they did in Jurassic Park, you construct your genome. But now we need a surrogate. So you're going to create passenger pigeon stem cells. Um, the best we can do, as I have up there on the next slide, oh, is induced pluripotent stem cells. And I've heard now that they can make um, Tony pulling cells, but I don't know all the details of that. Somebody in Japan uh, discovered a way to, to make cells undifferentiated, but I don't know much about that. That was like a month or so ago. Anyway, it's relatively routine to make these what we call induced pluripotent stem cells. Induced pluripotent stem cells can, uh, pluripotent means it can become like lots of different kinds of cells, right? So it's, it's got a lot of potential, but you can guide that development. So what they do is sort of guide it into becoming a germ cell, that is sperm and egg cell. This is, has been done. Uh, what you do is insert those germ cells into a surrogate. Now this was done with chickens and falcons. In other words, they took the falcon uh, DNA, made induced pluripotent stem cells, guided them to germ cells, put them in a chicken, so the, the chickens were hatched, but they had falcon and sperm uh, gonads. And then when, so when they gave, when they made it, they would give birth to falcons. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an interesting technology, you know, what people do in their spare time. This is the bad science kind of stuff, right? So we should probably let this out. There's a long list of candidates to go through this. Um, you can look at TED Talks, all kinds of stuff on de extinction. Um, um, we, we can talk about it some what, other what time. I had my benefits? Yeah. Oh, we can talk about it. There's a lot going on out there. Um, I, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, it's just people are working on it. And so here's the list, right? But here's like, so what about Neanderthal? We have their genome. That's not on the list. But I'd say, where do we stop, right? What are we, what are we doing here? Um, Walt Disney, my dead uncle Charlie. Um, where does it end? And at, at what point, what can't we do? Some people are very excited about this. <laughs> and through my favorite book, I tell you, I know not all that may be coming, but, what, but be it what it will, I will go to its laughing. From Moby Dick. Then there's the others. Again, from Moby Dick. For there is no folly of beasts of the earth, which is not infinitely outdone by the madness of men. Which I would also agree with. So there's a lot of controversy out there as whether this should be done or not be done. I'm not saying it should be or shouldn't be. I always say we can argue about it on our way to sort of go see the saber tooth cat. Because, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't actually, it would be neat to see one. <laughs> can't deny that. And you can't help sort of thinking like, yeah, it's probably not a good idea, but that would be cool. <laughs> so I'm in that kind of movie. Um, 
There are lots of sort of why nots. Ignoring current mass extinction problems, it's not good for animal welfare. Uh, promotes risky human attitudes, and I'm not sure about that. Some people say it's playing God, and I would say at what point um, have we not played God in some ways? So uh, that's not, I don't think that's the best argument. But um, So there's lots of arguments for and against it. And we can. It's being developed, just like cloning of mammals. It's sort of it's newer technology. It's just sort of emerging. But give it ten years, and it has been ten years since they tried it. And I'm, you know, it's hard to keep up with this stuff. Um, but it's moving along. And you know, it's a pretty profound world we live in, where stuff that was extinct we can actually bring back. In some cases, we caused it. Should we fix it? In other cases, like the saber-toothed cat, do we really want to fix that? I don't know. But basically, you know, uh, Frankenstein was a cautionary tale of tinkering with, with uh, nature. Um, will we unleash Mary Shelley's monster at last? I have no idea. Do <laughs> <laughs> um, you have any questions on that? That's my run through de extinction. Be aware of it, and if you want to know more about it, I teach a class that used to be called Conservation Genetics, which is now called Ecological Genetics, that would be the fall. If you want to know uh, more about like forensics and stuff,